My name is Hamas Akwestani and I'm a British Afghan model. Um, salam Dostan Aziz. Um, if that's okay with everyone, um, my Farsi is okay, but um, I think we have guests that would prefer me speaking in English, so I'll just do the speech in English. But before I start, I just wanted to ask you guys, how many of you thought that you wanted to pursue an unconventional career, like in arts or media, and have a second thought about it because you knew that you wouldn't have the support from our community. Because that was definitely, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure that this is something very common amongst us Afghans because unconventional careers are not very widely accepted, nor are they, we know much about them. So I'll take you guys back to my story. It all started a very long time ago when I was about five years old. Like Shabnam John also said, my parents also studied in um, Russia, so they both. Uh, they got married, they moved to Russia, and I was actually born in Russia myself, um, in Uzbekistan to be precise. Um, so it started off when I was about five years old and my mom took me to a park um, in uh, Russia where there was a fashion show. And um, I saw these girls on stage and I was mesmerized. So I didn't know what they were doing. I asked my mom, what is it that these, what, what are they doing? And she said they're models and this is a fashion show. And that's when the penny dropped for me. That was what I was going to be. It wasn't a question of, I wanted to be a model, it was a question of, I am going to do this, this is my career, this is what I want to do. And I remember telling my mom this, and um, she was always a very glamorous woman, so <laughs> she was always into her fashion and clothes. Um, she looked at me, found it amusing, thinking that um, it's because, you know, it's a face and I'll get over it. But I had tunnel vision, no one was going to take that away from me. And I remember coming home and sitting my parents down, that was my weekend activity. I would throw fashion shows for them, and anyone dare rate me anything below 9 out of 10. <laughs> All hell would break loose. I would, my mom hated that because I would put her skirt on my head and wear her heels, and I would put this fashion show on, and I was a model from that age. Um, it was great until we moved. This was me trying to <laughs> do, get into my moves. Um, it was all great until we moved to the UK, and um, that's when things become very difficult for me because, first of all, I had puberty, so I was not a very cute kid, <laughs> and the idea of modeling became a this far away distant thought for me. Not only that, but obviously us being new into the country, my parents were trying to be protective. It was very difficult for them to integrate into the British society and keep us safe and protected because we didn't understand. I didn't speak a word of English when I moved to the UK at the age of about seven or eight. And then 10 years later, I was representing the country in this world competition. So that's a great achievement for me looking back at because I didn't even speak the language. Um, 10 years later, I was um, representing England. But before I did that, I started modeling at the age of 14. Like I said, the thought of modeling was very far away from me because I moved to the UK and I thought it's not going to happen. So when I got spotted shopping with my friends, um, in Watford and they offered me, they said that we see potential in you so we think you should, we have a shoot, you should come down. Um, I remember coming running home and telling my parents that I got spotted for modeling and they knew that this was my childhood dream so they didn't want to take that away from me. Obviously I had to persuade them and I had to explain <laughs> and after some persuasion it, uh, my mom and dad agreed for me to go and do this shoot on the condition that she was going to come with me um, as I was young as well I needed to be chaperoned. My, and from then, when she was at the shoot, she realized that um, it was very professional and everybody's there to do the job, so she trusted me. And she allowed me to continue my work because she knew that I understood my boundaries. The boundaries were that I don't shoot lingerie or swimwear, which I respected. And to them, because of their, I respected what they've asked of me, they also gave me that freedom to be able to pursue my career. However, being a British Afghan model wasn't easy. Bear in mind, this was about 15 years ago when I started in, um, in my journey. Actually, more. I've been in the fashion industry for 19 years. So when I, they were, it, this was before the digital era and social media. So every time I went to a casting, they would look at me and say, oh my god, she's so exotic. What, what is she? We don't, we don't understand her because nobody looked like me. People didn't look like me especially in the world of fashion, especially in the mainstream media. I looked so different, but for me, where I was so determined that this is what I wanted to do, people's words just bounced off me. It was like, well, I, I'm still going to do this. I knew that I had to work twice as hard 
to prove myself that I was worthy of um, the same work that my Caucasian counterparts had. But it was always, I was always, would get cast up as the brown model, or as the Asian girl, or as the ethnic minority that they needed as a token to make it a politically correct image. It was, I was never the main model. And it was very difficult to have to prove myself that I was just as good enough as any of my other fellow colleagues. Um, but because I was so determined and passionate about my job, it didn't really stop me. It just provoked me to prove them wrong and to show them that I was worthy. When I was 18 years old, I decided to um, enter the pageant of Miss England, but not by choice. It happened while I was looking for an agency with my friend, and we came across the pageant. So she said to me, well, why don't you enter this pageant? And the first thing was, because I'm brown, like to do, to, are we forgetting this part that I'm not actually um, an English contestant to enter the pageant? She said, well, technically you fit the criteria. There's nothing about ethnicity, and therefore you're a British citizen, and you fit the height and the age and so on. You should, let's, let's go for it. I entered the pageant, it happened. The next day I got a call and I, said, I was asked to come down. Where London is very crowded, they have it into three different parts for London, so I was entering one of them. I went to the pageant with my friend on a bus with a rucksack, <laughs> with my dress in my backpack. I hadn't told my parents that I was entering a pageant. I just said, I have a fashion show, because I didn't know the outcome in it. I didn't want to come back home. So I did the pageant, and um, where I had modeled for four years prior to the pageant, I was very confident on stage, and I think that's what won the judges over. So then they announced me as Miss Maya, which was a qualifier for Miss England. And the first thing I did was call my mom, and I said, Mom, I want a pageant. I'm going, to, I'm going to Miss England. She's like, do you realize that this is a school night? Why on earth are you out? You need to come home right now. So I got in trouble, and I went home. Um, I explained to them what it meant. They didn't really understand it, but they said, OK. But the local newspaper took a little bit of interest in me. And they did a couple little articles. And so my parents thought, OK, maybe there's, this is a good potential for her to have a platform to speak on. So maybe we should take her seriously. The pageant took place um, on, in 2005 um, in Liverpool. So my family and I and my friends drove up uh, to the Miss England competition. And two days later, at the age of 18, I was crowned Miss England. <laughs> And I thought, here I am, a beauty queen. I didn't realize that I had to do 385 interviews in the first month that I had won. This is only some of the press clippings that I will show you guys. But as you could see from the headlines, it's all about Muslim beauty queen, Muslim. Like I said, this is just some of the clippings. I was interviewing from Australian time to the Canadian time on a 24-hour basis in Russian, Farsi, and English because I spoke the three languages. Mm. And every question that they would ask me would be, are you more British or are you more Afghan? Are you more Muslim or are you more English? You're presenting England. Do you have a boyfriend? Oh, is it because your parents don't like you? Are they impressing you? Oh, you have a boyfriend. Oh, are you a Muslim? Then how, you, how is that allowed? The British press is very legendary to try and corner you or get you to say something so they can sell a story. If it wasn't for my parents' guidance, I can assure you guys that I would not be standing here today. My mom and dad have both come from a very intellectual background. So they sat me down. They knew that I was going through something that I wasn't ready for. I got thrown in the deep end. I was 18 years old. And the press would ask me, what's your opinion on the British troops in Helmand province? I mean, I don't know. Do any other 18-year-olds would know that? I don't even know what Helmand is. Like, I, hadn't, I haven't been there. I don't know it. Yet they wanted to know my opinion as a beauty queen on situations like that. I got invited to the UN, I got invited to the Parliament, I got invited to the European Parliament when we were still part of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, my, they tried to make it very political. So what I had to do was sit with my mom and dad, and my, my dad would teach me the geographical, historical, um, all the wars of Afghanistan, and my mom would teach me the cultural, the social, the you know, religious, traditional aspects, so that I was constantly keeping that balance of being politically correct. It's like, I'm a British, British Muslim. Muslim is a religion, British is a culture. I'm both. I'm the example of what Britain should be. I'm two communities coming together. So I was always trying to put a positive spin on it. And even the Missing Men organization would pressure me into doing bikini and lingerie shoots because they knew that was something I didn't feel comfortable in doing. And every time I said no, because they were losing out money, the first thing they would say to me is that, 
we shouldn't have picked a Muslim winner. This is so bad for us. You, you're so difficult because of your background. So I continuously faced adversity and racism. I had a choice. After the first month I had won, it was very difficult for me, and I didn't know whether I wanted to continue this journey because of the pressure it put on me as an 18-year-old. So I took a week out, and Mama didn't raise a quitter. <laughs> so I thought about what I wanted to do. So and it was either to continue this and use this platform to make a difference, or to give up. And I obviously decided to continue my journey and can go to Miss World and represent England on a, Miss, on a World platform in front of two million people in China for a month. <laughs> That's a whole different story. It was very difficult to be away from home and be in China. But um, I managed to do the pageant even really well. But as you guys know, our Afghan culture, there's no winning. <laughs> when they found out that I was doing what I was doing, um, when Afghans or um, our culture doesn't understand something, they're quick to criticize and question instead of support, unfortunately. So, you know, kudos to my parents for tolerating all of that because they were the ones that were receiving the brunt of it. And the first thing that everybody said that you must be doing this because you must be stupid. You only look good, so that's why you're making money out of the way you look. Not that that was the reason for me to go to university, because both of my parents are intellectuals, it was always an option. Um, it made me um, want to go to university even more so, so I went to University of Creative Arts in Surrey and graduated in advertising and brand management, um, which was great. I really loved university life. Um, it was, I think, the only time that I actually felt like just a student, and it wasn't about how I looked or who I was or what I represented, and I really enjoyed university. Fortunately, I didn't really use my degree because my career is very short. Um, modeling only has a shelf life of about five to seven years. I'm very lucky to be still standing here and working because I thought by 25 I would definitely retire. Fast forward seven years later, <laughs> I'm still here doing what I love. However, I believe that the only reason I'm standing here today and I've managed to have a successful, successful career from the background that I am, I remember going to castings or shoots and people always asking me, where are you from? Because you look very different. And I tell them I'm from Afghanistan. And the first thing that they would always say to me is, what, both of your parents are Afghan? But we didn't think people looked like you. Why not? We have educated women. We have open-minded people. They're stereotyping of what the media feeds down their throats. And unfortunately, that's how they see us. So I always had to fight my corner and let them know that, no, this is me. And this is who I am, and I'm Afghan through and through. And I always felt like I was a, a bit of a representative for the Afghan community. But for me, I believe that the reason I managed to get as far as I have is because I had a, an amazing support system from my family. And for us Afghan women, the, where it starts, everything starts from the home. If you don't have a good support system in your home, you will not flourish or get far outside of the home. And this is where I'm speaking to the parents. My parents have given me all I needed to be able to become who I am. They did it with respect and guidance and understanding. So I was one of the lucky ones, I understand that. But it was never like that for me as well from the start because when we first moved here, they were very protective over me. They, were, they didn't understand how the world worked, but over time they adapted and compromised. And unfortunately, I still look around today and I see families forcing girls to get married at a young age and not pursue their university dreams. I see families forcing girls to not work and sit at home. And that's where, this, there's, this is why I've managed to do it and some of my fellow Afghans have it. Not because I'm any better than them or I look any better than them, but because I had the right guidance and upbringing to understand how to carry myself and hold myself in certain situations. And my parents had that trust within themselves and within me that I knew my boundaries. And this is where I think Afghan parents need to understand that when we come here to this country, of course I'm not saying that let's neglect our culture and forget everything we've learned, but what I am saying is that to understand the compromise and the balance that we do have to adapt ourselves to the society that we live in. You know, a, a school or an institution can't adapt itself to every individual that attends there their culture, so we have to do certain things to adapt to the culture around us. For example, this whole notion, for our parents, it wasn't possible to go to a mixed sex school. So they went to a boys school and a girls school. So they weren't socialized to understand how to have male friends or work with other males or females, vice versa. But that's not the case here. All the kids mostly go here to mixed schools. But all girls grow up 
being so fearful, even getting spotted with a male student or a male colleague, not just by their parents, by, but by any other Afghan, because what would the Afghan say to my family? And we're so worried about being scared of being seen doing very normal things that we can't even concentrate on our university work or on our jobs or anything because of what people say. And that comes from the homes. Our homes, our parents need to have more trust in us and more trust and understanding in themselves and the society that we live in. Like I said, I'm not saying turn back on, turn your backs on your culture, but I'm saying pick up the best bits from both of the cultures and understand that you're a mix of both, so I'm going to use the positives from both and utilize it to get somewhere in life, instead of being constantly held back and being told you're doing wrong. Because all we ever get told, if, we're, if I'm seen in a bus stop with a male friend and I know that an Afghan drove by, I'm scared now. Why am I scared? What am I doing wrong? But that's why this is where it's different with my family because I have that relationship with my mom that I tell her everything because she made that possible for me. And therefore, if anyone ever goes up to her and says, we saw your daughter doing this, she's like, yeah, I know she told me. And she had a great time because that's the relationship that she made me understand that if you're honest with me and you show me that respect, I will be honest with you and show you the respect back. And I really hope that parents understand that you can't hold on to everything that happened in Afghanistan. We live in a digital ge generation now. Kids have so much information at their fingertips that the mistakes that were made in the past by the parents will not be repeated by the children today. If they make little mistakes, let them learn from that. This is how growth comes about. Otherwise, they know all the information. And um, you know they can do this themselves, let them grow. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll just continue with my story. I, um, I, when I graduated university, like I said, I had the choice of either going into full-time modeling or um, getting into a job. And because my job, my career is so short, I decided to continue modeling. Um, I did modeling for a couple years, and I'm still doing so. However, I do believe that we live in a generation where it's all about building a platform and being more than just a face. When I started this industry, I lived in a different time, and it was all very about the illusion and like you wanted to be mysterious and unaccept uh, unaccessible. Whereas now, it's all about getting to know your audience and understand and building a platform. So this is why I'm here today. It's so nice for me to finally be able to share my story because some of you may remember it from before, but some of you may not. And it took me a very, I know people see me do this and think, oh, it fell on her lap, she's lucky. But I worked very hard. I, I faced so much racism. I was the only one who did what I did at the time that I did it. And I, it makes me so happy to see so many girls now getting more involved in the media, becoming makeup artists, <coughs> photographers, writers, directors. And it's, it's so nice to see that just because, you know, if I could do it and they could do it, you've got it in you too. It's just understanding those boundaries and keeping a balance and not forgetting who you are, but at the same time trying to flourish in what you've been given and the opportunities that are available here for you. I'm now looking to, hopefully, um, I'm working on a project that I want to publish a book um, or maybe like a list of memoirs of women who had faced um, abuse, domestic violence, forced marriages um, in Afghanistan. I feel like I have a platform and I have a voice and it's time that I do things that will help others and I would love to, if any of you guys know any women who suffered forced marriages or like uh, the Farhunda story and some of the others, I would love to get their stories together, put it in a book and get their voices out there uh, for the world to hear finally. Like Nobody speaks of our Afghan women. Um, we're the most neglected, um, I think, community and demographic. And I think it's time for us to come together and help Afghan women. And my, sorry, I, I don't mean to go on too long, but um, I just wanted to say that I think every Afghan's hopes and dreams for our country is to have unity and peace and forget all this tribemanship and like, I'm from here, you're from there. We're all Afghans, we're all the same, and we need to come together and support each other. Thank you.